Well, first I'd like to thank Nick Pudar for helping me understand what my wife has been doing with me for years, and now I have an acronym for it. It's IFT, if this, then that. And I also wanted to mention that uh, for those in the back and those out in the atrium, there are a row of seats right up in the front of the auditorium if you want to be uh, up front. Our first panel is titled, How Smart Devices Can Add Day One Value. Mentoring is Brian Doherty, Associate Director, Advanced Development and Intellectual Property at Visteon. Prior to assuming this role in 2010, Brian held leadership positions in Advanced Cockpit Electronics, ADAS, and Global Advanced Development. Tim Johnson is Director of Transportation Initiatives at Next Energy. Tim was formerly the Global Business Development Manager for Sprint Velocity, the connected vehicle business of Sprint Next Tech. And thankfully, he made it because he had a car accident on the way here. We have Scott McCormick, President of the Connected Vehicle Trade Association. Scott was also Executive Director of the Automotive Multimedia Interface Collaboration. Brian, it's all yours. All right, thanks, Gary. So today we're here to discuss how smart devices add day one value. And just to kind of set the stage, we thought we'd kind of uh, discuss what that really meant in terms of uh, it being such an open topic. So um, in terms of what we mean by smart devices, we're discussing systems that can be either uh, they're in vehicle systems or systems that are brought into the vehicle. Uh, so as well as connected services such as uh, vehicle to vehicle communications, which we also call B2B, vehicle to infrastructure communications, B2I, which we collectively call B2X, and then cloud to device type communications as well. So our focus today is gonna be on devices that provide or exchange information uh, to give useful knowledge to the driver or improve the driving experience. So some examples obviously of smart devices, smartphones, tablets, um, you know, safety systems, advanced driver awareness systems or ADAS systems, uh, infotainment navigation systems, telematics, and again, cloud-based services. So, you know, the car is going to be part of uh, the information network that helps people deal with driving safely, driving more efficiently, uh, health, and also convenience. So in terms of uh, questions for the panel, I'll start here with uh, Tim and Scott. Um, can both of you give some scenario examples that will illustrate uh, how smart devices will improve our lives as we go forward into the future? Sure, <clears throat> I'll start. First of all, I need to say, on a personal note, after um, Nick's presentation this morning, I feel a little bit like a panel discussing the Declaration of Independence after Thomas Jefferson spoke, so a little pressure on us, but we'll do our best. Um, yeah, so that's an interesting question and a great topic, and really, you know, thinking through that, more so, um, improving life through smart technology. You know, that means a lot of things in the context of transportation and driving, and I thought about it. I, like many of you in the room, are um, drivers in, in different scenarios. I happen to have an interesting situation currently where I live um, on the western half of, or western part of, the, of this state, and I, I work on the eastern part, so I drive a lot. I drive a lot across the state of Michigan, and then I travel and I rent cars. So I have the opportunity to um, experience in-vehicle connectivity, um, mobile life, and in a variety of ways pretty much every week. And when I think about smart devices and improving you know, quality of life in the context of transportation, there's kind of three broad <laughs> examples I'll give, and then I'll, I'll bounce it to you too, Scott. I think about um, anywhere from the doing the trans-state commute and wanting to keep the business moving, which means being aware of emails, texts, phone calls, all those things while I'm on the interstate system. That, that's one use case or one scenario. Another one is um, I'm traveling, I'm in a rental car, and like many of you who have traveled and, and do kind of what I do, you're often in that kind of difficult conundrum of you're late, you're lost, you're maybe low on fuel, and probably need to find a bathroom all at the same time. Um, that happens more often than, than not, unfortunately. And then there's another use case where I don't want to think. I, I want to sing. I want to put on Coldplay and sing a song or something. I, I want to decompress and chill. And what I think is interesting right now is all those things can happen. The first one is, is the most challenging right now, of course. But when I think about smart devices and, and making that happen, we'll get into this more as the morning goes on, it's that whole integration of all those things so that I as the user and that person desiring to play out all those use cases 
It just happens. It happens seamlessly. It happens simply. And ultimately, in the car, it happens safely. Um, there is a very well-known consumer electronics company that's done an extraordinary job on the seamless and simple part. And we, I think many of us in the room here, um, have it kind of incumbent upon ourselves to include the safe part more so. Not that it hasn't happened and there's a great effort underway, but it's got to be even more so. So I'll come back to that theme later today, but those are my first thoughts, Brian. Okay, Scott. Yeah, there's a, an example that's very fresh on my mind this morning. <laughs> um, you know, as I'm going down the expressway, I'm slowed down to a crawl to get from 96 on to 94 and had the woman behind me going 65 miles an hour had forward collision avoidance or forward collision warning or emergency brake light braking, she wouldn't have rear-ended me and totaled me. Um, on the other hand, you know, the, a carrying device like the smartphone with the map utility on it, tow truck driver, I routed the address here and he dropped me off right at the gate before he took my car to, to the impound lot. When we look at, at the traveler, not necessarily the car, not necessarily the, the driver, but when we look at the traveler, whether that's on a bus or on a bike or in a vehicle uh, or walking, um, there's a variety of mechanisms that we have to improve that travel and to make it safer. We can make it safer by the cell phone broadcasting your presence. And you might, you know, avoid, might avoid having, having uh, uh, pedestrian accidents, or in many cases, uh, there's a lot of, uh, of cycling accidents, particularly to universities and schools where there's a lot of traffic and a lot of, a lot of that kind of device. That requires that you have the ability from that nomadic device, whether it's a phone or a tablet um, or other device, to be able to communicate broadcast information so that the people that are in the proximity of where you're at, and that could be a car reacting automatically to that situation, or it could be the driver being informed of it, can have that knowledge and awareness that there's something different, that there's some situational change that they need to pay attention to immediately. So as we go through this conversation today, try to keep in mind that when we talk about smart devices, the car can be a smart device, the bicycle can be a smart device. In fact, I believe Apple just filed some patents on that. The phone is a smart device that, that's going to look at how we integrate those, how we, how we make those uh, all work uh, seamlessly together. Great, great answers. Um, now let's explore that just a little further. You know, as we get more and more smart devices uh, in vehicles, both brought in and built in systems, we're going to start seeing information from those devices and systems in the cloud being combined. Maybe we can discuss some examples. Um, Scott, maybe start with you this time on how you see some of this information being combined to add even further value, where one plus one doesn't equal two, but really now equals three because of the, the fusion of the information. Mm -hmm. the, let, let's talk about data for just a minute before we get into how that can be used. Because uh, a lot of people talk about big data, and we don't know, I don't know that it's very clearly understood. Data can be big not just by volume. It can be big by the velocity at which it's coming at you, by the variety that you're getting, or by the value of the data. There can be two or three data points that are extremely valuable, but it's not a lot, and that's still considered big data. When you look at the car, the car will generate about an exabyte of data a year. That's a billion gigabytes. Now, the majority of that, 98, 99% of it, is information that the car is using to control its steering, its braking, its engine, its temperature, his cold play tunes, whatever those are. There is very, very small amount of data that actually is relevant to your specific travel and, and your destination, your origin, and, and your behavior as a driver. That information has a lot of value. Most notably, the insurance companies use it because most people think they can fake driving well for 90 days in order to get a reduced rate. But what it actually captures is only between 6 and 20 data points of, of how actually you behave on the road. There's other pieces of data like how often you, you, you travel in a particular area. And, and under consideration right now is the government's looking at, well, should I tax you just on the gasoline that you use? Or should, if you're driving on a congested highway during uh, peak hours that causes more maintenance and more opportunity for, for accident, is there a cost associated with that as opposed to somebody that may work at their home and very rarely do it, or as opposed to somebody that you know, drives across the state on a frequent basis on, on less traveled roads, if you will. So when you look at the type of things that are out there, 
Now we're saying that we need to extract new knowledge. We don't necessarily need all that data that's coming off the car. We need to figure out what is the, the gems of knowledge that are being generated that are useful to you as a driver, that are useful for, for other companies to determine how to make that transit safer and, and more efficient. Yeah, I agree with that, Scott. And similarly, um, we're just in an era where there is so much information, and I'm going to touch on this theme throughout the morning for, for, a few, for several times, actually, but it's really that the smartest of all smart devices is you know, a brain, so to speak, right? I mean, the brain processes you know, millions, billions, whatever the number is of, of items and issues constantly, and then does something with them. I think about many fine folks represented in this room and in the industry, and the challenge that exists right now, which is also an opportunity, clearly, from a business perspective, to take all these forms of data, which up until not too recently have been quite disparate, and they still are actually. We're gonna talk about NHTSA and, and a new form of RF, I think, later on this morning. But really, um, back to you know, what is a smart device and how can we start to, to tie these things together? What's really, quote, needed, not that it's not being worked on, but needs to accelerate and it just needs to occur in some manifestation, is that, that filter, that kind of, you know, brain, as it were, that processes all the incoming and outgoing um, data and needs and then, process, and then delivers it in an appropriate manner you know, to the user, to the vehicle, in, in, in a timely, relevant manner. I mean, back to Scott's issue this morning, you know, he wouldn't have been limping right now had, had the right sensor technology been in process and, and did its work in, in real time. So again, it's, it's a very complicated time we all live in right now, but it's an incredibly exciting time, you know, fraught with opportunity for, for many technologists and people on the business side to wrap the business model around it, kind of that aggregation and um, sensibility um, promotion of, of all this information. And so again, very exciting. You know, again, we're, you know, again, Nick gave, gave a great history of connected vehicle and, and there's some great um, embedded and brought in and, and combination of those things underway now. We need to take it to the next level so it truly is synthesized. Thanks. Well, it's unfortunate that we have such a relevant example this morning with Scott's experience, but one of the interesting parts of that scenario that Scott described is there was actually a vehicle behind him um, that veered out of the way and then it was actually the vehicle's two cars back that plowed into the back of them. And one example I think of you know, combining data is even if that the car that hit Scott had a forward collision warning system, there may not have been time for that system to have alerted the driver <coughs> and actually you know, prevented an accident. It may have, may have helped a little bit. But V to X, you know, vehicle to vehicle communications, if all of those cars have been equipped, adds another layer of information to that ADAS system. So as you start looking at combining information, say from a vehicle to vehicle communication and the onboard sensors, I think you'll really start to see a better situational awareness both for the driver and for the vehicle's computer systems to pre-charge the brakes and or start, start active braking. If I can just interject here, for those that may not be familiar with the acronym, V to X is the, is the concept of the vehicle communicating to something else. V to I is vehicle to the infrastructure. Vehicle to vehicle would be V to V. There are a number of others. Vehicle to D is the vehicle to device. Um, it, it all falls under the umbrella of V to X. Um, so now let's uh, kind of look at maybe off-board systems. So uh, examples where collective knowledge from smart devices, from vehicles, communicating with infrastructure or others will improve the driving experience. And here I'm talking about like uh, county road operators or state road operators uh, knowing where the potholes are, or knowing where the slippery road conditions are um, to maybe target salt application, you know, if they missed a spot. So. Yeah, that's a, that's a great example. I, I, was, I was given a talk to the New Jersey DOT, and the deputy um, uh, director pulled me aside and he said, we, we'd like to do something in this space. We want to do something real, but we don't have any, uh, much money. And I said, well, what is one of your biggest cost drivers? And he said, well, road maintenance is our biggest cost driver. And there was an individual standing there that I'd been talking to um, who was a, had a small company that did software development, and I pulled out my cell phone and I said, well, this smartphone has a very good three-dimensional accelerometer on it. So sitting in my pocket or my briefcase or on my seat or in, in a, somebody's purse, it can actually register the severity of, of a pothole or a bump that you hit in the road. 
I said, now, if you put an, an app on, on that phone and put it out for people to download, I said, thousands of people would do that if you're going to do it so that it'll help you reduce your, your road maintenance costs. That brings down your taxes, makes you more efficient. And he said, and I said, not only would it give you that information, because it could also geolocate it by the GPS that's on the phone, I said, over a period of time, a week or two, as hundreds of cars drove over that spot, it would be able to tell you how severe that pothole is deteriorating, how quickly it's deteriorating. It also will tell you, are there collectively others in that area? And so now you can triage your maintenance, not just for a particular you know, large pothole, but you can do it in a more intelligent fashion. And the individual that was at the software company said, and I can write that program for you t tonight. And that's actually what they did. So, I mean, that actually provided real value, didn't drive a lot of costs, used the intelligence that people carry around with them. Um, another example was the, the, the Boston uh, Transit Authority. They, their IT guy had put GPS units on all of their buses, and they were collecting where the bus location was real time all the time. Problem was he didn't have any budget to do anything with it. So in a stroke of genius, he said, I'm just going to stream the data on, onto our website and let anybody use it if, if they want. Within one week, there was an Android application that allowed you to tell from where you were standing how soon before your bus would get there. And within two weeks, there was an iOS application for it. And it really didn't cost anybody anything. Yeah, no, great examples. I think, you know, back to, um, to, to your question as well, and back to what I said a few minutes ago, it, it's an amazing time because you can have local county road commissions who are suddenly in the mix in a very important role of the puzzle piece of the system of systems of, of new mobility, which goes back to the theme of this day in this conference. And because of the technology, because of the new and creative business models, which are both existing and a more open-mindedness exists to, to embrace them, we can now, again, collectively, those of us in this room in a position of leadership can, can take advantage of all these pieces and ultimately, you know, lower situations such as Scott's this morning, improve the roadways, which can also avoid, help avoid accidents, et cetera. So again, I think it's incredibly exciting. It's a great question. It's a great thought. You know, let's look at every element that makes up transportation and mobility and see how they can not only contribute with their technology or wherewithal and or, you know, create new revenue models that, that didn't exist before. So it doesn't become a cost situation. It becomes a value prop for the given entity. And that's what excites me and many of us in the room I know. All right, thanks guys, great answers. Um, you know, one comment I'll just make, and, and this is interesting in, in this whole discussion as we add these applications and systems, is that you know, consumers like systems that really provide value all the time and give them feedback. So that's why some apps succeed and others don't. So you know, if they feel they're getting value, um, you know, things are quite successful. Now let's switch you know, specifically to talk about vehicle to vehicle and vehicle to infrastructure communications, as I said before, we, in the industry call it V to X. Um, there was a recent announcement by Secretary Fox and NHTSA, which is the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration, about vehicle to vehicle communication technology in terms of the rulemaking process and um, the expected timing. And so Scott, maybe you could start, just give us a little background on that announcement. I know you've been intimately involved in these discussions. Um, as we have as well. So yeah, many of you may have heard about the safety pilot. It was a, uh, uh, a test of about 3,000 configured vehicles in both Ann Arbor and in California, where they were putting a load on. There's. Let me back up just a little bit. There's about four different ways to communicate to a moving vehicle. You can use satellite. You can use what, Wi-Fi if it's available. You can use cellular, and the, the federal government allocated a tremendous amount of spectrum. Uh, at a very high frequency called Dedicated Short Range Communication, DSRC. And the value of that spectrum is that, it, 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 for one thing, it has limitation. The signal only propagates about 300 meters. And, but the value is, is that it's free. You're not paying for any airtime. And it has extremely low latency, which means it's very, very fast, right? And it's also very securable. It's, it's easy to secure the communications that come out of that. So that became since about 2005, 2004, a major effort by a consortium of automakers to develop how we would use that communication protocol to communicate safety message sets for one thing, and eventually to allow us to move more into automated vehicle functions, because you have to have the collective intelligence um, that goes on. And so 
Over the years, they developed that protocol. They ran a number of tests. The safety pilot in Ann Arbor was one of the big ones, so that they, and they collected something like 500 terabytes of data in a, in a six-month period. And now they're analyzing that and learning it. They learned enough to be able to recommend through the, through the Research Innovative Technology Administration, which is now headed by uh, Assistant Secretary Greg Winfrey, and through the Joint Program Office, they said, yes, we believe we should move towards the path of rulemaking. It gets sometimes misreported. The notice for a, pro for a proposed rulemaking is a lengthy process. Uh, Secretary Fox should be able to, and I believe is planning to, have that notice published before the current administration ends at the end of 2016. It'll take about two years to get to that point. Then the process allows for a couple of years of comment. Um, and that has to happen because this is new technology. The one thing that, that NHTSA, the National Highway uh, Safety Transportation Administration, can't do is they can't come out and mandate that you have a requirement in your vehicle for a hardware or an application or a system or a communication protocol for something that hasn't been used, for something that hasn't been tried out. Um, many of you may remember when analog brakes first came out. When analog brakes first came out, it would brake you, but you couldn't steer. It would only break in a straight line, and it took them a couple years to figure out how to integrate that in the system. Traction control systems took a couple of years to figure out how to behave on all types of weather and road and traffic conditions. And those all have to be modeled into the vehicle. So there's a lengthy process for them to study and evaluate and test and, and do their own testing, because if you're an automaker, you've got a couple of major issues. You have to have something that's robust, works all the time, every time. It has to be ubiquitous. It has to work everywhere that you're going to drive in the United States and Canada and, and, and Mexico. And it has to be something that you're able to trust for liability reasons, that it won't fail, right? So that takes a bit of time to understand. And then after that two-year period, they'll give them a year and a half to two years to actually implement into a variety of vehicles. But that doesn't mean that they're going to make a ruling and then it'll be six years from now before you'll see this in cars. Obviously, as, it becomes, as the public becomes more aware of what this capability is and what it can bring to you, they will start to understand the value proposition. And car makers are now putting these systems into cars to figure out, well, okay, how do I, how do I see what my issues are? I, I'm going to put it in, in high-end cars or to, to those demographics that I sell to that are more fault tolerant, that allow you know, research that activities to occur and not hold them back from wanting to buy another version of the car. So our expectation is that we're going to see these systems being deployed throughout the years over the next coming years until we get to the point of rulemaking, not because it's going to be required, but because they, there's real value in that and there'll be consumer demand for it. Yeah, likewise. I think it's very exciting. Um, I think on two broad fronts why, why it excites me and I think I'm encouraged by it. One is it more formalizes the public-private partnership necessary to, to kind of stitch together this system of systems we've discussed. Um, so that, that's one. Secondly, and we've been talking about this already, it, it adds another element to that kind of mesh networking as it is different ways to connect, right? And so, you know, many in the room, of course, and, and those who may be watching this have heard of terms like CDMA, which is the network technology that's used in the U.S. by some carriers. GSM is another one that may be familiar. Now there's a new acronym, DSRC, Digital Short Range Communications, which enters the, the mix. And because of that, it's, it, it adds more opportunities to use infrastructure to provide connections and ultimately provide value on both for end users and, and certainly for, for the many entities involved in building out the infrastructure. So again, it, it's going to happen. The, the, the announcement by Secretary Fox just further validates that. And even though the process will take several years of, of the policy side, it means it's moving forward and it's an encouragement, I think, and, and a good news story for all of us. And if I can, the, the policy aspect is, is very important. Um, who has the liability is, is one big question that has to be answered. There's a lot of discussion about who owns the data. The reality is that the data question is much, much simpler than, than a lot of people make it look. If I buy a television with a remote control, I may not want the television manufacturer or the government or my wife knowing what channels I'm watching, but that doesn't give me the right to the data stream coming out of that remote. That's probably intellectual property for the, for the company itself. The same is true in your car, you know, that, that you may want to know what all of this data is. The, the really, you really don't need to know what the signal is. There's, on average, 42 networks in a vehicle and 150 sensors. 
You know, your tire pressure monitor is sending a signal that says, here's what your tire pressure is. You really don't need that information. And it's, and it's not in a man-readable format anyway. So there's questions about who owns what data, and that'll be sort of decided, but pretty much the automakers will determine it. And the reason for that is that the United States has no comprehensive digital data privacy law, and it never will. And that's because of the laissez-faire form of economics that this country operates under. It, it, there are 24 regulations. Each one is very industry specific. They deal with HIPAA, with insurance, uh, medical information, with trading, with financial transactions. All of them are non-mandatory to observe. All of them recommend industry oversight. So the issue is that it's not illegal for Tim to know, you know my driver's license number or, or, or Brian to know my credit card number. It's, there are laws in place that, that punish you for using it inappropriately or for your personal gain or to my detriment. And that's how this country works. And that's how it's going to continue to work. Because there are no, uh, there are no reasons to change that. It has fundamentally in, in ripping tons. So those aspects in terms of privacy, in terms of of, of, of data ownership, in terms of security, and in terms of liability are also the things that have to be explored and, and at least come to some consensus over the next few years. Thanks. One of the things I'll, I'll add to that, um, Scott mentioned you know, the range uh, of B2B communication or B2X is about 300 to 500 meters. It can be a little more depending on conditions, but it's kind of a line of sight system. One of the, the advantages of that short range is that you're essentially communicating the essential information to the vehicles that are around you that you care about. You don't really care about a car that's on another highway half a mile or a mile away in terms of your immediate safety. So the system is somewhat self-limiting in terms of its range and, and where the information shared. So just some of the, uh, the interesting vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle, uh, features that that are gonna be part of this new system are emergency electronic brake light, which we already discussed. So you would get a warning if a vehicle, even several vehicles ahead was suddenly stopping. Curb speed warnings could come uh, either from an internal system or from roadside equipment if there were dangerous um, uh, curves. A stop vehicle ahead, uh, slippery road conditions could be transmitted either by vehicles ahead of you or vehicles that sense slippery road conditions with their uh, wheel speed sensors and then transmitted to, it to roadside equipment, that could then be transmitted back to vehicles as they passed a curve or a slippery spot. So the NHTSA announcement you know, covered passenger vehicles. Um, there's also going to be a uh, discussion this year with commercial vehicles with the Federal Highway Administration. Can you comment on that as well? Yeah, the, the, most people aren't aware of this, but the only class of vehicle that the federal government can regulate without vetting it through the states is interstate commercial vehicles. And a couple years ago, we saw them do just that over about a four month period. They passed a law that says there's no texting in, in, in commercial vehicles. That's really critical, that, that whole process, because whereas the passenger vehicle side will take five or six years and require a lot of vetting, that doesn't have to occur on the commercial vehicle side. And one of the, uh, I'm one of the six industry advisors, Secretary of Transportation, we made the recommendation last year that they go forward with putting in not only vehicle to vehicle, but vehicle to infrastructure communication requirements for commercial interstate vehicles. And when that law, if that law goes, regulation goes in place, that's for all vehicles, not just the new ones that are made next year, that's all vehicles. And it affects all states. And it's a very short decision-making process. And one of the reasons for saying we want vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle safety message sets and vehicle -to infrastructure is this. First of all, there's a lot of real estate in, in, in a commercial vehicle. So put where you would put the device, an aftermarket or embedded device, is, is kind of an irrelevant question. Secondly, if you have to add an antenna, they really don't care what it looks like or where it's placed, where you do care about where it looks and is placed on your car. If you put that in, now think about what your car has is, or your vehicle, a commercial vehicle has as your sensors. Windshield wipers know if it's snowing or raining on the ground. Doppler radar can tell you where rain's falling out of the sky, but it can't tell you where it's hitting the ground. Your car can, okay? Your car can tell you where those, if it knows if it's below freezing, okay? It, so it knows if it's an opportunity for, for, for traction control problems, for icing on the road, for all of those things. So now if you have interstate commercial vehicles and you have this requirement, now you've solved the business model problem for the public entities. 
because the signal can hop vehicle to vehicle to vehicle. It doesn't have to go to a tower. The signal can hop. So you could put up a tower where I-75 crosses into Ohio, and one where 94 crosses into, into Indiana, and one at, 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 at the bridge, and you can harvest road traffic weather conditions all day long for free in near real time, not just on those expressways, but also on the secondary and arterial roads, because his truck may pass me, and I may pass his, and him may get on the expressway, and that signal can then hop down to those places. So if we actually view that if this rulemaking goes forward, that that could actually be a watershed moment for, for bringing this technology and this capability to life, because you'll have a proliferation of devices, and it'll all be crowd ranked out within a year. You'll put immediate load on the 5.9 spectrum, which is under pressure right now, quite frankly, because everybody wants to have unlicensed devices have as much bandwidth as they want, and the problem is, is that those unlicensed devices aren't necessarily your refrigerator talking to your toaster. It could be the people in, sitting in your back or passenger seats with their personal devices doing something. And so we want to protect that spectrum as long as possible. Thanks. Yeah. Real quick, and just kind of on the macro level too, just thinking about that, um, you know, the, the Class 8 and other types of vehicles are, are bigger, more expensive, have more capabilities. In effect, they have kind of a more force multiplying effect, either for good or bad, right? And so if the technology allows them to be safer, allows them to be more efficient, allows them to crash less, all those things are for the common good in, in a factor even much more elevated than an individual consumer car. So, so I'm applauding and, and encouraging that the, um, it's not just consumer vehicles, it's also large commercial vehicles. One thing I would add, too, is that, you know, as this technology moves forward, it's, it's somewhat like the Internet in the early days, right? So people didn't really have an appreciation for how important it would become when it was first developed. Um, and it's just kind of grown and taken a life of its own and it added a lot of new applications that no one could even conceive of at the time. And I think vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communications and vehicle infrastructure, once you start having some of that information, as your examples have shown, they'll just be more and more uh, examples of things that we don't even, can't even conceive of today. Um, let's, let's switch gears a little bit here and, and kind of broaden this beyond V to X. Um, you know, how do you see things changing over the next few years in the larger mobile ecosystem? So this is including telematics, um, you know, infotainment type services, cloud-based services, internet in the car. Sure, well, I'll go first, I guess. Um, I guess. Two things, one, back to your prior question, Brian. I mean, it is much like the advent of the internet, but I think even a more appropriate analogy may be it's, it's like the advent of the interstate system, right? In the 1950s, when it was being designed and begun to be um, thought out and built out, who would have known the bi billions and billions of dollars of revenue and industry that was gonna grow and expand because of somebody saying, what if we had 45,000 miles of interstate system in the US, what would that look like? I mean, nobody really knew. And so we're kind of at that same um, juncture here of kind of a new, you know, national infrastructure, of course, that's invisible, but it acts very much like the paved interstate system. So just thought there. Secondly, and I know this is gonna be addressed in great detail throughout the day, primarily near the end of our day, but, um, and it's, it's been said already last evening and, and this morning that the, the broader mobile ecosystem, the car, of course, is, is an important, critically important aspect of it, but it's not the only aspect. It's just, it's one component of my kind of connected mobile life. And I'll continue to, like all the rest of you, you know, make choices because now the technology exists to make those choices in a real time and in a very smart manner. You know, some of the folks who sat in these chairs last night spoke about that technology enabler. So again, very exciting time just enormous amounts of technology that exists and business models stitching together, which is, is, is wide open for many of us. And um, yeah, there, there's really no end to it. But the fact that the attitude is there and the technology is there to support it is, is very exciting. Yeah, I think the, the analogy that we're looking at explosive growth that occurred in, in the late 80s and early 90s with, with the internet and the services that were provided is what we're seeing this technology um, being able to provide going forward. We see a lot of that going on. But that's pretty much where the analogy ends. And, and the reason for that is that there's a picture on the screen behind me of a, of a future dash. The use of a cell phone requires you to focus your attention on it for using an app, same thing with a tablet, for any kind of pneumatic device. In vehicle, the, the basic rule is that you have to be able to locate 
a control or some information and, and activate that and return your attention to driving within two seconds. Because at highway speeds, those two seconds are the length of a football field. So the whole human machine interface is different. You know, and it requires that, that your attention be appropriate and not distracted, not even being distracted by varying signals that you may be getting in, in road conditions. There's a lot of work being done to say, well, okay, how many audio signals can we give? How many video, verbal, or, or, um, or light, lighted dash signals can we give before, you know, we've actually overwhelmed the driver? And, you know, the, the reason that you have to study all that is because even if you've done everything possible you can, we know that 20% of the people, when, I'll call them an idiot light, when the engine light comes on and says, you know, you're out of oil or whatever, and your car's gonna, engine's going to cease, we know that 20% of the people do nothing. They, they actually just ignore it. So we have to move more to the fact where that the, the car helps protect itself from doing those things. Okay? Globally, what you really have to appreciate is that this is being worked on everywhere. There are different reasons that different cultures and, and different uh, countries focus on different areas of it. But car makers sell cars all over the world and device makers sell devices all over the world. The thing you have to appreciate is the combinatorial aspect of all of these technologies going forward. Look at where your phone was five years ago. Can you imagine what its capability is going to be five years from now? We're talking about having flexible screens that might wrap not for your television but wrap over your dash and be able to bring information up in an appropriate manner. That could be showing you what's ahead at night when you're driving. There's heads-up displays that are saying we're going to project that image out five or so that it appears five or six feet in front of your dash so you don't take your, your eyes off of the road. Then there's all the aspects that are going on in, in intelligent vehicles for, for the work that's being done in, in, in objects like the Google Car and the DARPA Challenge. But th those are very rudimentary. Uh, the Google car is a good example. It has first order intelligence. First order intelligence is a ball rolls out into the street. It can avoid it or break. Second order intelligence is what you and I have. Ball rolls out in the street. Our nearly instant second thought is there might be a child following it. And to grow that level of decision making is, is, is a humongous task to be able to put those rules and those capabilities into a moving vehicle. And if you try to encapsulate all that knowledge in the vehicle, yes, you end up with a $350,000 Prius like Google has. So you need to use the collective intelligence of the road, the cars, the infrastructure, and other devices that are around. All right, thanks. Uh, one, one last topic area we thought we'd like to discuss is the optimized user interfaces um, personalization that we're seeing in vehicles today. So user interface, uh, sometimes referred to as the human machine interface or the driver vehicle interface, so HMI is an important part of that equation. You can see up on the screen here some examples uh, that Visteon has of some of our concept uh, HMIs. Where do both of you see HMI, uh, the human machine interface or the vehicle interface going in the future as we're integrating more and more uh, information both from the cloud, from sensors, from vehicle to vehicle communications all into that cockpit area? Yeah, I'll jump in real quick. So back to my earliest comments about kind of the life I live. I, I rent a lot of cars, as do many in the room I know and, and watching. And frankly, you know, it, it can be often almost daunting and, and, and often at least challenging to um, get into a car in a matter of a minute or two, you know, get to where you're going or figure out where you need to go and, and get on the road while managing, you know, a fresh new HMI dashboard. And, you know, how do I turn off the radio or how do I turn it on? How do I... The other day I was somewhere that it's not usually so cold, and they had preset the heat at, I think, 89 degrees in the cockpit. And it took me several minutes to figure out how to, <laughs> to, to lower that temperature while I was trying to figure out where I was going as well. And so I guess I would say in all due candidness and all due respect to many of my, my fine friends in the auto OEM and Tier 1 community, and it does go back to that holistic view, you know, HMIs cannot be sexy. They need to be efficient simple, seamless, and, and safe to aggregate and deliver all the content in an appropriate manner to the driver because the technology exists to do almost anything, of course, in the vehicle from a visual perspective, but, but great visuals don't necessarily equate to smart and sensible and appropriateness. So I think it's, again, even within the, the confines of the OEMs and the tier ones and those partnerships and the technology <coughs> providers to look at that the, the value of aesthetics, 
plus the value of, of again, relevant and sensible transmission of information and, and not disparate and siloed departments as they often are within the organizations today. So kind of candid view on that. You have to look at the vehicle, human, the, the, the interfaces that are in the vehicle in, in a couple of different ways. And I absolutely agree that, that it was actually less distracting in the 60s when you, in 70s when you had a radio that you pushed a button for. Because you preset it and you knew where it was. Now you have a dial, or you have a touch on a touch screen, or you have, you know, to slide something that way. You can't do that without looking at it. You can't do that without taking your eyes off the road. So in the evolution, you know, and, and, and there's been a lot of, 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 you know, you've got the Ford font and the GM blue and, and, and the Toyota, you know, uh, structure in terms of where icons are placed. Now when you're moving into an environment that says we're going to personalize, you've got to allow you some level of personalization in your vehicle. You know, this person wants Pandora radio, that person wants to voice updates to their Facebook, somebody else wants stock quotes read to them or their texts, somebody else wants, you know, a broader selection of, of just their music. As you get to the point of saying, well, we're going to allow that, you also have to appreciate that, according to the automakers, 60% of the people that are buying their cars now don't even care if there's a radio in the car because they bring their tunes in, okay? And it, this is causing, actually, shockwaves throughout the, the, the broadcasting industry because they're saying, well, okay, if I'm not having customers that are caring about FM radio, then there goes an entire business. So they have to figure out how to repackage their content so that it gets to, to the people that have continuity going forward. Well, you can't just take what you do on your phone, if your phone's bringing in those tunes, and put that on the dash because it's even more distracting. And you can't just try to cram one more icon if you look at GM's Q system or Sync. Or, you can't, you know, that real estate is taken up, right? And so it has to be some extremely intelligent user interface thought put into this that they should be going back to Silicon Valley to get some information on. Not to copy it, but to figure out what those best practices are that they can migrate into the vehicle. Or how do I integrate my phone app to the car so that that phone app is now traveler safe. You know, unfortunately, you know, there are things out there to do it now. There's, there's apps that will, you put on your phone and it will, once you're going faster than 15 miles an hour, it won't allow you to text. 99.8% of the people that buy that app put it on their, their, their teenager's phone. They don't put it on their phone. All right, thanks. Mm -hmm. I'll just add to that, uh, great comments. Um, you know, that is one of the things, you know, from an HMI standpoint or human machine interface, you know, you know drivers want timely contextual information that, that shows them exactly what they need to see right when they need to see it to either avoid an accident or get the information they need on their route or, or that. So, and I think that's what the whole industry is working towards exactly as you guys have said. So I'd like to thank our panelists here, Tim and Scott, for a great job. And, uh, Thank everyone for the opportunity to speak here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Brian.